Well, our special guest on left, right and centre tonight is someone who has served as, as an advisor to former Pakistani Prime Ministers, including Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif, who's also served as Pakistan's envoy to the United States. Hussein Haqqani is back with us and it's great to have him here with his latest book, Reimagining Pakistan, Transforming a Dysfunctional Nuclear State. And this is a terrific book because it really looks at all the problems that Pakistan is currently facing, whether it is the problem of religious fanaticism, extremism, how the state has ended up uh, promoting jihad or terrorism and at the same time what potential the country has uh, to actually go forward from here and uh, Hussein Haqqani of course is known for his very forthright views on his own country that is why he's uh, disliked by many in his own country and has to live in exile actually in the United States and you also have an arrest warrant out uh, f uh, by the Pakistani Supreme Court well, I if think you don't mind my asking that first, what happens to that? I think that uh, the arrest warrant will be treated with the contempt that the rest of the world has for Pakistan's judicial and law enforcement processes. Unfortunately, uh, the Supreme Court of Pakistan should not be in the business of issuing warrants. That is for trial courts to do. Uh, and in any case, uh, the international community understands the political nature uh, of the Pakistani judicial system at this moment. That's actually very sad, isn't it? That it, the Pakistani judiciary has become so politicized. It, ha it is sad. And what is sadder is that they still insist on playing these little games for Pakistani media consumption. They fully know uh, that uh, their warrant is not going to be entertained outside of Pakistan, but they still insist on going through these motions because they want to impress the people of Pakistan and want them to live uh, in an information bubble that they have created for them. This is a really fantastic <clears throat> book for many reasons because it, it, it really looks at, in a sense, the psyche of Pakistani people, its military, uh, you know, this whole uh, issue of an I its identity vis-a-vis -vis India and, and so many different facets. But in your uh, uh, initial chapter, you've talked about how Pakistan is seen by the world today. It is seen as the country chosen by Osama as his home for many years. It's identified as a country pro prone to coups, military coups. Uh, for its blasphemy laws, for imprisoning, murdering and lynching individuals for religious reasons, uh, the lashkar e taiba and its attack on, uh, on, on Mumbai, etc. This, in a sense, you believe sums up the way pa the world looks at Pakistan. So what I say is that uh, the way Pakistanis want the world to look at them uh, is impaired by this. And I want Pakistan to be seen positively. Uh, it's my country and the country of 200 million people. Uh, you cannot keep 200 million people. You can't wish away 200 million people. So basically, this is a policy book which looks at what policies have brought Pakistan to this pass and what new policies can Pakistan adopt that will change not only the perception but also the reality. Uh, Pakistan has tremendous potential. Uh, young Pakistanis are brilliant, uh, but at the same time, the country is almost a little under half the country is illiterate. Uh, Pakistan has a very high uh, school dropout rate. Uh, there are more uh, Nepalese who finish high school and end up in university as a percentage than Pakistanis. Uh, recent UNICEF report shows that Pakistan has the world's highest infant mortality rate. Those are the things that hold Pakistan back. Pakistanis should be fighting those uh, issues rather than being um, uh, being tied down with terrorism, extremism uh, and uh, the whole security situation which uh, Pakistan finds itself in today. So this book is both uh, analytical as well as prescriptive. But you've also explained in, in some amount of colourful detail that whenever so someone like yourself even and others criticise Pakistan, you know, immediately people jump back or the powers that be will jump back and call it a, a Jewish conspiracy Mi or an yeah. Indian conspiracy and, and there's a reluctance to accept that there is a problem. So Nidhi, first of all, let me say that I use the, I prefer the word critique to criticism because criticism implies you're putting negative. somebody down hmm. and being negative. Critiquing is absolutely essential. Look, Americans had slavery at one time. Some people stood up and said slavery is wrong. You illustrated and, that And very that well. is why, yes, I do mention it. And that is why it was possible for America to change uh, uh, away from slavery. Then they had segregation. And somebody said, that's wrong. And critiquing your own policies and your own decisions is the way forward. 
Unfortunately, what we have created in Pakistan is an echo chamber in which anybody who critiques and points out that maybe there is another way forward. And people should have the right of offering two or three, four different policy options for a nation. But when that is done, people are branded traitors, people are attacked. And look, I'm lucky I'm outside of Pakistan. Those who are inside Pakistan, you've probably heard, many people are nowadays disappearing. Uh, people, yeah. people are being picked up and nobody knows where they are. Some people end up in prison and some people end up dead. That is not the way forward for our nation. And I want Pakistan to understand that facing problems is always better than denying them. One of the things you've talked about also at length is this whole issue of identity and how uh, sort of Pakistan looks at its own identity vis-a-vis -vis India and that, that sort of obsession with India. You said somewhere that since independence, the state of Pakistan has persisted with maintaining the threat perception about Hindus now represented by India as wanting to eliminate or subjugate Muslims. You've talked about uh, basically, uh, you know, young, for, for, for the sake of young Pakistanis, it's important to go beyond the bitterness of 1947. Explain to us why in at least the military and the establishment, that whole notion of Pakistani identity is so sort of weaved so into India. So first of all, Nidhi, let us remember that Pakistan was not created with a lot of analysis and foresight. There was a lot of lack of preparation. Even Pakistan's capital was decided at the last minute. And the city of Karachi, which wasn't prepared to be the capital of a large country, was made the capital. So on the one hand, Pakistan's great strength is that it has been resilient. It has survived all this time. But on the other hand, it is time for Pakistan to take stock as to why we are unable to plan better. The reason why we have this particular brand of national ideology, it's not like Pakistan was created on the basis of the ideology. The ideology has been created after the creation of Pakistan. When partition took place, Pakistan got 19% of British India's population, 17% of its revenue sources, and 33% of its army. So it wasn't that we had a threat for which we raised the army, we had an army for which we had to raise a threat. And that is how this whole conflict was born. Now, let me be honest here. Kashmir did play a role in it. And even today, uh, human rights violations in Kashmir end up feeding extremism in Pakistan because people uh, have a great uh, emotional attachment to uh, their uh, kin in Kashmir. But it was a decision, conscious decision, to cultivate antagonism partly because that was the way to make people feel that we are different. Now, what has changed? In 1947, everybody overnight went from being Indian to, to becoming, being Pakistani. Yeah. Today, 95% of us were born as Pakistanis. So we don't really need a contrived identity. We don't need an ideology to identify us. We are Pakistanis by birth. And when we are Pakistanis by birth, our focus should not be on why we are Pakistanis, but what Pakistanis can accomplish. One of the other important uh, aspects that you really d dwelt on uh, is Islamist rage, ideological dysfunction. You've talked about the blasphemy laws, and unfortunately, like you said, uh, that, that often does make headlines. And if you could just tell us a little bit about that, the, uh, the sort of uh, how this has grown. And, and you've talked a lot about how Zia, for instance, introduced things like stoning and flogging, etc. And how that has actually grown and sort of turned into this uglier, uglier monster today. So basically, Zia built on what he inherited, which was already pretty bad. I have pointed out, and by the way, there has been meticulous research in this book. You've probably noticed that there are hundreds of footnotes. I, I went into the Library of Congress and looked at newspapers going back to 1942 to be able to get things from then. Uh, and one of the things that strikes me is that there have been protests in streets of Pakistan uh, on religious issues that look totally superficial and sometimes downright stupid. For example, once there was a protest about a book that had been published in 1932, but the protest was taking place in 1970. Now, <laughs> w why protest a book that had been published in many years ago? I, I, well, 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 you know, people in India were protesting till a few months ago uh, uh, about a queen who lived, you know, 800 years yes, ago. Yes, so. exactly. And by the way, uh, since we are talking about that, let me say that the, in, in some ways my book is a cautionary tale. Uh, Indians should definitely learn from it that playing these games 
uh, of trying to turn on people's emotions and play to various kinds of communal sentiments can end up creating the situation we have in Pakistan where Pakistan is the world's sixth largest country by population, uh, sixth largest army in the world, sixth largest nuclear arsenal, but 26th by size of economy on PPP basis and 42nd by size of economy on the basis of nominal GDP. These things don't make a country economically prosperous or even powerful. All they do is unleash sentiments and that's what's been done in Pakistan for years. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. When Ziaul Haq was doing it, people thought, ah, this is a way of uniting the nation and making it strong. Well, guess what? After that, that same issue, all those issues that were meant to unite Pakistanis on the basis of religion have ended up dividing them. And there has been a rise in sectarianism, there is a rise in religious sentiment against minorities, and those things have not helped the people of Pakistan. Do you also think that there's been a failure of the, those who were democratically elected? Uh, you know, whether it was Nawaz Sharif or Benazir Bhutto. So, to, to you to read the book, I, yeah. I have pointed out that it's wrong to blame the Pakistan army only for all of Pakistan's setbacks. Yes, the army has been a major factor, but Pakistan also has had a succession of political failures. And that failure comes from the desire and willingness of Pakistani political leaders uh, to either pander to uh, some military dictator or military leader or pander to religious groups. Uh, only recently we saw a protest in Islamabad a few months ago, hardly three or four thousand people showed up, uh, but it was a religious protest and because of that the city got shut down. Nowhere else in the world does a city of uh, 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 several hundred thousand get shut down by only three thousand people showing up for a protest. There was a protest by the Pashtuns in Islamabad the, uh, and Peshawar the other day and th those have not even been covered by Pakistan's media. This attempt to deny reality and fabricate an alternative reality has played a significant role in how Pakistan's politicians uh, basically do not rise up to the plate and say... Except some rare moments. Which some rare moments and, you know, they, as leaders they have to stand up. And a leader's job is not only to say, my people want this, it is also to tell the people what they ought to want. When Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah said we will create a Pakistan, there wasn't a groundswell of support for Pakistan. He gave arguments and then he got support on the basis of those arguments. I think Pakistan will be better served when we can have similar environment in which somebody like me can go and say, hey, this is not what we should be doing with Pakistan this is the other way that we should follow. You can't do that though. And we can't do that because we have a culture, a political culture of conformity and those who enter politics, they want office more than they want changes in policy direction. Of course, here in India, what we are most concerned with when we look at what's happening in Pakistan, I think all of these things is something that in India should, should be concerned with, but it is of course the support to, to terrorist groups like, like the LET. Uh, do you see that as something that just will not change in the foreseeable future? I would like it to change, uh, but let me just say that unless Pakistan has a collective, overall, overarching uh, direction shift, uh, expecting some elements of the policy to change without the directional change is unrealistic. Look, here we have an environment in which people turn around and say, if we are somehow uh, harming India or checking India's rising influence, uh, then that's okay. Uh, then if we pay a little price in the form of terrorism at home, that's worth paying. Now the Pakistani military to its credit has acted against terrorists, but it has acted against terrorists who have been responsible for attacks inside Pakistan, not against terrorists who have attacked inside Afghanistan or India. Uh, Will will that policy change overnight? I don't think so. In fact, the 
uh, policy seems to be to try and mainstream Hafiz Saeed and Lashkar-e yeah, Taiba. Exactly. And what the we're international now. community is not going to like that. So Pakistan has to come in sync with the international community instead of defying it, because that is the way forward. Well, uh, I must ask you about this paragraph, which made made me laugh a little bit about you talking about the paranoia in Pakistan and the sort of when you make alternative realities, etc. There's one paragraph where you talked about. Because the law doesn't recognize that Pakistanis buy, sell and consume alcohol, the state pretends that alcohol-related illnesses just don't exist. Reports of alcoholism or alcohol addiction are handled by private charities. They're not officially acknowledged. For years, Pakistan even denied it had any HIV AIDS cases. But then the problem ballooned to affect possibly 2 lakh people, 200,000 people. Uh, that is quite absurd. Now, you will realize that I am quoting a scientific paper on this subject people who have done research and found that there are many people in Pakistan who have alcoholism complaints. But the doctor who did this study said that the problem is that because of the legal situation, uh, people would rather say, hey, this isn't alcoholism related, this is something else. Whereas it is absolutely alcohol al alcoholism. There are many other things. Basically, denial is always an instrument of policy for authoritarian ideological states. And history tells us that ideological states don't do as well as pragmatic states. So there's a lot of research and a lot of comparative studies with other countries. Pakistan has the potential to be the next South Korea or Japan if it set its mind to it. Uh, I but was right just now, in Singapore. Yeah. Singapore's population is tiny but their GDP is so much larger. Why can't Pakistan set as its well, target a higher GDP, greater prosperity for our people, and a universal literacy, universal health care? Well, again, reimagining Pakistan, very interesting read there. Hussein Haqqani, great to have you back with us tonight. Thank you very much for coming in. And that's Thank it on the show here. tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow. Goodbye.